Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. O oh Lord, your mercy endures forever. Your mercy reaches so far that we as human beings really can't fathom how great your mercy extends because you said from everlasting to everlasting, the mercy of the Lord is given to those who fear you. And Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. It is because of your mercies that we are not consumed because your compassions fail not. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, your mercies are new each and every morning. My goodness, what a God you are. Thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, if it had not been for you, O oh Lord, that look down upon this earthen vessel of clay and extended mercy, O oh Lord, where would we be? Where would any of us be? But great is your faithfulness, O oh Lord. Great is your mercy, Lord God. Oh, your mercy, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. Lord, may your mercy carry us through today. Give us this day our daily bread. Feed us with the hidden manna that only comes from you. Teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. You said if we call out to you, you would pour out wisdom. If we call out to you, you would give us knowledge. If we call out to you, you would give us understanding. Give us counsel, Lord God, and strength. Fill us with your spirit, hallelujah, that we may always fear you. The fullness of the Ruach HaKodesh dwell in us mightily today. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In the name above all names, Yeshua HaMashiach, we ask it all. Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of when the temple in heaven is open, everything will change. And if you're listening to this message and you've been left behind, you've missed the rapture, the first thing that you must do is call upon the name of the Lord. His name is Jesus Christ, the Savior of our souls, the one who died on the cross and rose from the dead, who took our place on the cross so that we could live forever with him when we place our trust in him. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace fell upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The Bible promises that whoever calls on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. So all you have to do is call out to him. He will take away the stony heart that's in you, and he'll give you a heart of flesh meaning that you will receive his Holy Spirit and you will be born again. You will be accepted into the beloved family of God and you will live forever in the kingdom of God. Therefore, call upon him. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. I pray to see you in the number when you see the saints come marching in and you are with us riding on white horses as you're raised from the dead to live in the kingdom of God. For surely he comes quickly. Maranatha and amen. Well, praise the Lord, family of God. You know, I was doing some studying and sometimes when you study and, you know, when God pours out those living waters, it, it just like overwhelms you at times. And it just, it blows your mind, you know. It's like a, a never ending stream, a never ending fountain of truth. And I want to share uh, one aspect of what God was showing me the other day, uh, and I'm still working on this other aspect, and I'm not really going to hit on the other aspect yet until, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit irons out all the details when I can handle it, because it's just so much. But suffice it to say, I want to talk about the pattern. You see, because everything that was written in the Bible is according to a pattern. Everything that God has said in his word was written for our learning, according to the Apostle Paul. All of the scripture is profitable. That's what the Bible says. And so when we go to any place in the scripture, there is always something to learn, always something to glean, always something that God is trying to show us and teach us. And so 
that falls into line with what the writer to Proverbs says. You know, we don't lean upon our own understanding, but we acknowledge Jesus in all of our ways. And we trust in him by praying to him and asking the Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us into all truth. And the only way that he's going to do that is to show us what's in the word of God, because the word of God is truth. And so I really can't hammer this point home enough, but I'm going to keep on hammering it at home because we have to get on the same page, my friends. It's what the Bible says. I don't care what we've heard from teachers of long ago. I don't care what we've heard from theologians who live before us and theologians who live today. What God says is true. And therefore, we either accept what he says or we reject it. There's no in between. There's no gray area. And therefore, because Jesus Christ said that he has told us all things beforehand, we can go to the Bible to understand how God is going to act in these last days. And this brings me to the teaching that I want to hit on today, the first aspect of the 144,000, okay? This is, this, is, this is Bible study, okay? So uh, help us, Holy Spirit. You, you gotta, we got to have a clean slate. Let, let's, let's, let's just do away with all the preconceived notions. Let's do away with all the preconceived notions of whatever you've heard about the 144,000 and let's see what the pattern says in the Bible. Let's see what the pattern says in the Bible and let's go with what God is going to say. I just pray that we can do that, that we can do that together because if you're hungry for truth, let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. And through this teaching, I'm going to show you that the 144,000 are raptured. They're raptured at the same time as the body of Christ. They are raptured at the same time as the body of Christ. And I'm going to prove this in several different ways by what the Bible says. The first proof text that the 144,000 are raptured at the time when the body of Christ is raptured is how the 144,000 are sealed. And this comes from Revelation chapter 7. So as you see this map, you see the encampment of the tribes of Israel when they camped in the wilderness. You have the east. On the east, you have Judah, Issachar, Zebulon. And on the west, you have Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim. And so Jesus Christ, when he comes, when he comes on the clouds, when the Son of Man is revealed, he specifically tells us that he is going to come like lightning that shines from the east to the west. We see this here. Okay, I'm, there's going to be several points I'm going to make. This is the first point how Jesus Christ comes. Matthew 24, 27, when the Son of Man is revealed. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, so we know that when he comes, he's coming on the clouds first. So when he comes down upon the clouds to get us, he's going to come from east to west. And Oh, let me stay on point. But no, let me just say this again. Let me say this. You see, it's just so much. I, I forgot about this point, but I want to I wanna make this point because I believe this is also key. When man first fell, okay, now we got to go all the way back to the garden. When man first fell, what happened? God had planted a garden in the east of Eden, right? According to Genesis chapter 2, and then he placed man there. And so when our first parents fell, what happened? God expelled the man and the woman, and then he placed a cherubim on the east of Eden. Okay, now look at this. Look at this, because I, I'm, I'm going somewhere with all of this. Uh, and we're, we're, going, we're getting down to the bottom of the truth, because there's a purpose for why Jesus Christ is coming from the east to the west. Okay, so let's go back to Genesis, because we always have to go back to the beginning. Okay, everything is told at the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. So this is the fall of man and when man was expelled from the Garden of Eden. 
what happened? Uh, verse 22, and the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from where he came. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree, tree of life. So when man fell and he was expelled from paradise, God placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. So man was expelled towards the east. Okay. The way to the tree of life was blocked beginning at the east of the Garden of Eden. So when God brings redemption, when God brings redemption, when he is revealed on the clouds, he begins at the very place where man was first uh, fell into rebellion. He begins at the place where man was expelled at the east of the Garden of Eden. And when Jesus Christ brings his redemption, he begins at the very place where man was first fell into rebellion at the east. Jesus Christ comes to bring his redemption beginning where man first fell towards the east. That's why he comes and he starts at the east and he goes to the west. Okay? From east to west. From east to west. You see, that's the key. That's, that's a key point that I wanted to highlight because we see the ceiling of the 144,000. We see that these 144,000 are sealed from the east to the west. Okay? When the 144,000 are numbered and named, we see this in verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. The first tribe that is sealed is the tribe of Judah. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Where, where did the tribe of Judah encamp? The tribe of Judah, they encamped on the east. I got all these windows open. I'm sorry. So here goes the tribe of Judah right here. Man first fell and was expelled towards the east of Eden, where the flaming sword and the cherubims were stationed. When God comes like lightning and he shines from east to west, the first camp that he comes to is Judah, who was camped at the east. You see? So if this pattern holds true, when Jesus Christ comes from east to west, the last tribe that has to be named has to be either Benjamin, Manasseh, or Ephraim. Do we see the pattern hold up according to what the Bible says? Who's the last tribe that is sealed? Verse 8, of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. From east to west, beginning with Judah, ending with Benjamin from east to west. Who is on the east? Judah. Who is on the west? Benjamin. Beginning and end, east to west, east to west, east to west. The coming of the Son of Man will be like lightning that shines from east to the west. Okay? From east to to the west. It's the same pattern with the 144,000. And that's just the first point because there's so much more to this, okay? Because I want to show you this as well. Now, if you know uh, any good Bible commentaries, they will always tell you, or they should, if, like I said, a good Bible commentary, they will tell you that Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14 serve as interludes, okay? So these are like Inter, uh, they're interludes into the progression of the book of Revelation, okay? The reason why Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14 are known as interludes is because this is showing us the rapture happening in real time. You see, this is showing us the rapture happening in real time. So we're going back to when the temple in heaven is open on the cloudy and dark day when Jesus Christ descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. 
and the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14 are showing us the rapture happening in real time, but again, this is a supernatural event. Okay, so in the infinite you know, workings of God who he does things in the supernatural, but it's natural to him. It's supernatural to us. This is going to happen in an instant. It's going to happen suddenly. The Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught up. We're going to be changed. Just like he says when he's revealed in Matthew 24, 27, it says lightning. You know how lightning strikes. I mean, it's, it's just bam. Okay. It just flashes. <laughs> this, this is not like <laughs> this event. Okay. Let me just try to make it like real. This event isn't going to be like, oh, here comes the cloud. Here comes Jesus Christ slowly moving across the skies from east to west. Look, I, I'm, I'm waiting for him to come, and we're just looking at him coming on the cloud, all slow motion. No, th th that, that's not how it's going to be. There's no time to get ready when this day comes. There's no time to get ready. The time to get ready is now. You have to be ready when this day comes because it happens instantly. It happens suddenly. It happens immediately after the tribulation of the days that we are in now. Immediately after the tribulation of the days that we are in now. When people are crying peace and safety. That's what's coming. And immediately when God says go, sudden destruction is going to come upon the planet. Beginning with the rapture of the body of Christ and the 144,000. So this event, as you should know, is going to be... So fast, so quick, so sudden, just like a lightning flash, that you have to be ready when this day comes. And so in the book of Revelation, he's showing us the supernatural slow down so that we can read it with our finite minds and understand it and how it's going to happen. And so in Revelation chapter 7, look at this. Verse 1, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Okay, so this is showing us exactly what's happening right when the rapture is about to happen. Before any harm could come on the earth, before any of the judgments come upon the earth, God is showing us that the four winds are being held back by the four angels that are standing at the four corners of the earth. These four angels standing at the four corners of the earth are the four living creatures. These are the four living creatures, okay, because the throne of God is coming down. The throne of God is coming down. The temple doors are going to be opened in heaven. Jesus Christ is going to suddenly come down. And when he comes down, who does he come down with? He comes down with Michael the archangel specifically. As 1 Thessalonians tells us that he descends with the voice of the archangel. So verse 2, here comes Michael. Verse 2, then I saw another angel ascending from the east. So this should clue you in that this is Jesus Christ coming from the east to the west. Okay? He's coming from the east to the west, and he's coming with Michael the archangel, who's also descending with him. And as they're descending, they're also ascending, because Michael is going to stand up. Okay? He's going to stand up. There's going to be war in heaven. And as Michael stands up and there's war in heaven, we see Michael ascending from the east, telling the four angels who are at the four corners of the earth, not to do anything, not to bring any harm to the earth until the 144,000 are sealed. You see, this angel is standing on behalf of the children of Israel. That's why we know this is Michael, because Michael is the chief prince over the children of Israel. Verse 2, then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. This angel is watching over the children of Israel. There's only one angel that is said to watch over the children of Israel. That's Michael. 
let me show you this. Let me just show you this so we could all be on the same page. Uh, Michael. Michael, the chief prince. The chief prince. The chief prince over the children of Israel. The chief prince. Uh, praise God. Uh, here we go. Uh, Michael. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here we go. Uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. Here we go. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. So again, we see here when uh, this angel was trying to get a message to Daniel in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, uh, he was being withstood. But then, because Michael stands on behalf of the children of Israel, Michael came to help this angel in order to get this message to Daniel. Again, we see in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, when Michael stands up, he's again said to stand over the children of Israel. Uh, uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Okay, so Michael is in charge of the children of Israel. He's the angel in charge over the children of Israel. OK, and so when the children of Israel, the hundred and forty four thousand specifically are being sealed, who appears ascending from the east, the same direction that Jesus Christ is coming from. OK, as Jesus Christ comes from the east and shines to the west like lightning, he's coming also with Michael, the archangel, because he descends from heaven with him, according to First Thessalonians chapter four. So this is Michael, the archangel, and he's giving charge to the four angels who are at the four corners of the earth, not to release the four winds until the 144,000 are sealed. Okay, the 144,000 who are sealed are the children of Israel. So this is Michael the archangel. This is showing us the rapture slowed down in human time so that we can understand exactly what is taking place. I pray that you got that. I pray that you got that because I want to go to the next point. You see, there's so much to this. Hallelujah. So we see the rapture taking place, uh, the rapture taking place in slowed down form. So what happens in Revelation chapter 14? OK, so now we're going to go into a little bit more deeper waters. Oh, let me let me let me rewind. I'm sorry. I forgot to talk about Ezekiel 9. OK, so Ezekiel 9 is showing us the same event. OK, Ezekiel 9 is showing us the ceiling. OK, so let me just read Ezekiel 9 and then I'll explain it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel chapter 9, he cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, cause them to have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lies toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Verse 3. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Okay, so this man who God is telling to set a mark on the foreheads of everyone in Jerusalem that sighs and that cries for all the abominations that are done in the midst of it is the Old Testament shadow of the event that we just went over in Revelation chapter 7. When we see uh, before the judgment begins, the winds are being held back. We see Michael ascending from the east, going from east to west, crying with a loud voice to the ones who have the power to hurt the earth, the trees, and the sea, not to do anything until the 144,000 are sealed on their foreheads. It's the same thing that we read in Ezekiel chapter 9, okay? And so uh, we see, uh, as we continue to read verse 5, and to the others he said in my hearing, so the sealing has to happen first, okay? The sealing has to happen first before any of the judgment begins, 
Okay, and then once the sealing takes place, then the judgment begins. Verse 5, and to the others he said in my hearing, go ye after him through the city. So after the 144,000 are sealed, then those with the slaughter weapons, these six men who have the slaughter weapons, go forth through the city to smite, okay, to kill everything. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the residue of Israel in your pouring out of your fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, my eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. Verse 11, And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as you have commanded me. Okay, so when this happened in Ezekiel's day, Ezekiel felt like he was the only one left. Okay, there's only 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes that are being sealed. Okay, it's only a remnant. Okay, and we're going to get to this when we get to Revelation chapter 14, because I'm going to prove this other point, which should, which should throw away all doubts about this being the rapture. Hallelujah. And so, we see the Old Testament shadow. We see the, we see the Old Testament shadow. We see the evidence that the 144,000 are sealed before any harm could come upon the earth, okay? That's the same thing that we know about when the rapture happens, okay? The rapture takes away everyone who has the seal of God, everyone who has the Holy Spirit, everyone who's been born again, everyone who has not been appointed unto wrath, we're going to be spared from this time of trouble, this time of trial. Okay, and so let's go to Revelation chapter 14, and I want to show you this. Okay, I want to show you this because here we see the we see the rapture concluded. Okay, we see the rapture concluded, and this scene in Revelation chapter 14, uh, verses 1 through 5, it goes hand in hand with many scriptures that we're going to put together. I want to build this picture, okay? So remember, Re Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14 are like interludes to the story. And so these are flashbacks to when the rapture happens and when the rapture is completed. And so Revelation chapter 14 verses 1 through 5 shows us the rapture completed and it's showing us the same event that we're going to sh that we're going to read about in different places in the book of Revelation. Okay, and we're going to put line upon line, precept upon precept, so that you can understand this and that we could all come to a right understanding about this. Okay, uh, because this is critical. This is critical to understand because uh, there is so much meat here. Uh, hallelujah. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Okay, so they're sealed. And where are they at? They're on Mount Zion when the lamb is standing. Okay, so where do we see the lamb standing uh, in the book of Revelation? We see the lamb standing in the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter uh, 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 5, I'm sorry. Let me go to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. We're, we're going to see the lamb standing because th this is critical. This is this is absolutely critical because it's the same. It's the same event shown from a different perspective. OK, it's the same event shown from a different perspective. Uh, Revelation chapter five. OK, so here we see in Revelation chapter 14 that the lamb is standing on Mount Zion. That's the heavenly Jerusalem. That's the father's house. He's standing up. 
And when he stands up, there is 144,000 with him that have his father's name written on their foreheads. They've escaped from the time of trouble. So we go to Revelation chapter 5 and we see where does the lamb stand up here? Okay, verse 6, Revelation chapter 5. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. So this is the same scene shown from a different perspective in Revelation chapter 14 with more information, okay? The lamb standing on Mount Zion in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, with 144,000, is also this scene right here in Revelation chapter 5, when the lamb stands up. Okay, when the lamb stands up, he's on Mount Zion as well, and he's on the throne. Okay, he's in the midst of the throne. Okay, and being in the midst of the throne, it means he's on the throne because him and the Father are one. Hallelujah. And so we see the same scene. Okay, now look at the details because we can't miss this now. Okay, now verse two, we're going to see the church now. Verse two, and I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters. And like the voice of loud thunder. Okay, I'm going to start right there. So when we see the Lamb standing on Mount Zion with 144,000 and the seal of God in their foreheads, the next thing that John says that, he's, that he hears from heaven in Revelation chapter 14 is the voice of many waters. And like the voice of loud thunder. Okay, so what, what happens in Revelation chapter 19? In Revelation chapter 19, we see the voice from heaven. And who, who's the voice from heaven in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6? And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings. Okay, so look at this. I, let me just slow it down so we can get on the same page. This Revelation chapter 14, verse 2. When John says that he heard a voice from heaven, and that voice from heaven was like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder, he's saying that he heard them say something, okay? And Revelation chapter 19 tells us who that voice is, and that voice is of a great multitude. And the same descriptions of this great multitude are given in Revelation chapter 14, uh, as well as Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. So this voice of a great multitude, it had the sound of many waters, and it has the sound of mighty thunderings. It's the same thing in Revelation chapter 14, verse 2. The voice from heaven was like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. So who is the great multitude? Who's the great multitude? Well, the great multitude is those who have come out of the great tribulation. As we see here in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, a multitude from the great tribulation mentioned right after the sealing of the 144,000. Verse 9, after these things, Revelation chapter 7. Now, just stay with me, please, because there's, I haven't even got to the good parts yet. I mean, it's, it's all good, but there's just so much more. Stay with the teaching. Hallelujah. Help us, Holy Spirit, so we could put this all together. You're going to see it. Okay, you're going to see it. I know you will. Praise the Lord. Now look at this, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Okay, so this great multitude comes from every tribe, people, group, and nation, and tongue on the planet. It's the body of Christ. It's the church. And they are said to have come out of the great tribulation. And so you say, well, how could they have come out of the great tribulation? Well, the Bible tells us. Now, look at this. This is Bible study now. <laughs> this is Bible study. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, hallelujah. Well, let's, I'm, let, let, let me just show you this. Let me just show you this. Let me show you this. Let me show you. Let me show you. Oh, help us, Holy Spirit. Great tribulation. Look at this. Look at this. Great tribulation. How many times is great tribulation found in the Bible? 
three times. Okay, three times the word great tribulation is mentioned in the Bible. Matthew 24, 21, when Jesus Christ is describing the great tribulation that will come upon uh, the world. And the next time you hear about the great tribulation is in regards to the church. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 22, when God is speaking to the church of Thyatira. Okay, he's speaking to the church now. He's speaking to the church the church who is made up of all nations, tongues, languages, and peoples. He's speaking to the church, a warning about being cast into the great tribulation. Now look at this. This is Bible study. This isn't man's opinion. Okay, this is, this is Bible study. Revelation chapter 2, the corrupt church, the church in Thyatira, the warning of being cast into the great tribulation is given. Okay? If you do not repent, the church of Thyatira is cast into the great tribulation. This is what God says. This isn't what I say. Look this. Let me read it all. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Verse 22, here's the key. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, here's the kicker. And I will kill her children with death and all the churches. Does it say some of the churches? Did it say a few of the churches? No. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. There's going to be people left behind who said that they know Jesus. There's going to be people who honored Jesus with their mouth, but their hearts were far from him. There's going to be people who are going to be left behind and they're going to be cast into great tribulation because the church is supposed to be out of here when God comes down on the clouds. If you say that you know Jesus, when Jesus Christ comes from east to west to pick up the body of Christ, you are supposed to be in the cloud party. You can't be left behind because if you're left behind, it's great tribulation for you right when it begins. Because there is going to be the worst time in human history coming upon the whole planet. And specifically, it begins with those who say the name of Jesus. We, you see, people don't understand how terrible and what's coming during the day of the Lord. The name of Jesus is going to be outlawed right when the day of the Lord begins. You can't even say the name of Jesus. It's the devil incarnate who is going to come down upon the planet. And it's not going to be the great tribulation for the Jews at first because they're going to be deceived into thinking that the Antichrist is their Messiah. So the Jews are going to be all for the destruction of everything that has to do with Jesus because the Jews in their deception hate Jesus. Okay, they hate Jesus. So for the first three and a half years, the Jews are under the impression that the Antichrist is their Messiah. And so the onslaught and the killing that are coming to those who are left behind who claim the name of Jesus is going to be yippee. Uh, uh, it's going to be a party for the Jews. They're going to be all for it. They hate Jesus and everything that he stands for right now. And for the first half of the tribulation as well, because they're going to be deceived. You see, if you're left behind and you say that you know Jesus, you're going to be killed. Okay? The great tribulation begins for you if you're left behind right when the cloudy day begins. Okay? That's the fifth seal of the martyrs. Okay? That figures into the fifth seal of the martyrs. There's people being killed left and right when the great, when the, when the great tribulation begins for those who say that they know Jesus. Okay, the great tribulation for those who say that they know Jesus is the whole seven years. Okay, but for the house of Israel, 
that first three and a half years, it seems like the kingdom has come. They're deceived. They're deceived. The great tribulation for the house of Israel doesn't really begin until the last half of the tribulation, the final three and a half years, when they finally realize that they made a mistake. When the devil incarnate in the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple, sits down on the temple uh, seat, the mercy seat, and declares himself to be God and demands all the world worship him. And the false prophet tells everyone to take a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And they tell the people of the earth in that day to build an image to the beast that had the wound by a sword and did live. It's only at that point when the great tribulation begins in earnest for the house of Israel. But for those who are left behind who say that they know Jesus, the whole seven year tribulation is great tribulation. Okay. Because you should have been out of here. You should have been out of here in the cloud party when Jesus Christ came from east to west like lightning on the clouds, but you were left behind because you were corrupt. According to what the Bible says in regards to the church of Thyatira, he will cast you into great tribulation. That begins for you. If you're left behind right when the cloudy day starts and God says all the rest of the churches will know all the rest of the churches will know because you should have been caught up. You're not there at the marriage supper of the lamb. You're not inside the father's house. Where are you at? You're left behind. You're in great tribulation. You should have been inside the father's house. The door should be shut behind you and you should be rejoicing before the throne. But no, you thought that God was a fool. You're left behind. You're in great tribulation right when the tribulation begins. It's great tribulation. It's great tribulation for anyone who says that they know Jesus if you're left behind. It begins right away. Okay, you got to get a proper understanding of this. Please help us, Holy Spirit. I pray that you got it. I don't know what else to say, but the Holy Spirit teach us. Hallelujah. Okay, now look at this. Look at this because there's just so much more. Help us, Holy Ghost. Okay, so I pray that you understand that the voice of a great multitude is the raptured church and the voice of the great multitude speaks right after. Now we're going back to this revelation chapter 14. We're going back to this. Let's let, let's get back on, on track. Okay. So revelation chapter 14, verse one, let me begin here again. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their forehead. So the 144,000 are caught up. They're with the lamb on Mount Zion. Okay, this is the rapture completed. The rapture is completed at this point. And this is the same scene that's taking place in Revelation chapter 5, but from a different perspective. When the lamb stands up. Okay, when the lamb stands up. Okay, it's the same scene from a different perspective. And so, what's the next event? Then there comes a voice. And this voice is from heaven. So there's people in heaven. This isn't on the earth. This is a voice from heaven. And the voice from heaven is like the voice of many waters and like the voice of a loud thunder. It's the great multitude. As we just went over in detail, it's the voice of a great multitude. And what do they say? What does the body of Christ say? Because we're right there with him. We're also caught up. And what happens? What is this voice saying from heaven? Verse six, Revelation chapter 19. And I heard as it were a voice of a great multitude and as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings. This is what we're saying. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. That's what we say. That's what the voice is saying in Revelation chapter 14, verse 2. This is what the voice is saying. This is us saying that the marriage of the Lamb has come. The rapture has been completed. The rapture has taken place. That's what is being said right here. When you put line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. That's what's being said. So you can put... In Revelation chapter 14, verse 2, where I've highlighted that, you could put what's actually being said when you go to Revelation chapter 19 and look what's being said by the great multitude that has the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunderings. This is what we say. 
Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. That's what we say. That's what we say. That's what's being said right here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 2. That's, what, that's what's happening. The 144,000 are mentioned first. Then the great multitude, the body of Christ speaks, and we say the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And then what happens? After that, we, then we see this. And I heard the sound of harpists playing with their harps. Now there's a procession. There's a musical procession. And who are playing with their harps? There's a musical procession because what's happening? What's happening when the marriage of the Lamb has come? The marriage of the Lamb has come. We're given our white robes. There's a, there's a marriage happening. Okay, and there's music being played. And if we go back to Revelation chapter 5, we see the harps. Who has the harps? Hallelujah. Who has the harps? Okay, look at this. Uh, praise the Lord. In Revelation chapter 5, uh, we see... Uh, the lamb stand up, and uh, this uh, this procession of, of music is being played as the lamb takes the book uh, out of the scroll. I mean, takes the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Let me read it, verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay, so it was the elders who had the harps, and they were playing on their harps as the marriage was being uh, done. Okay, as the music, as the procession was happening when the, uh, when the lamb's wife was receiving her white robes and we were being married to the lamb, the elders were playing on their harps, okay? As well as when the lamb is taking the seven seal scroll out of the father's hand, the music is playing all at the same time, okay? It's the same scene, but it's told from multiple perspectives with more information uh, piled on top when we put all the puzzle pieces together, okay? And so uh, uh, when... Uh, back to Revelation chapter 14, we, we see the 144,000 verse 1. We see in verse 2, uh, the, the voice from heaven, which is the great multitude saying, the marriage of the Lamb has come. Then uh, we hear the sound of harpists playing with their harps, which is uh, when the marriage, uh, when, the, when the church receives our right robes and uh, the Lamb takes the scroll out of the Father's hands. And uh, we see this here. We see this in Daniel as well. You know, when, when, when the clouds of heaven come, uh, when the lamb stands up, look at this. And then I want to get to this new song. I pray that you're, you're with the teaching. Uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We see this in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we see this. Uh, this is the cloud coming back before the Father. Uh, verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Okay, so this is when the Lamb is standing up on Mount Zion, and in the clouds of heaven are the 144,000 and the raptured body of Christ. And uh, we say hallelujah. Uh, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and as he comes to the Ancient of Days, there's music being played on harps. And he comes and he takes the scroll out of uh, the hand of the father and he begins uh, the judgments of the day of the Lord. Okay. And so uh, in Revelation chapter 14, after John says that he heard the sound of harpists playing with their harps, look at verse three. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Okay, so here goes the new song. Look at the, uh, the key. They sang as it were a new song before the throne. Okay, so the new song is also first mentioned 
in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For you were slain and has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay, so the new song is what? You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Okay, that's the new song. It's the same song that says that uh, that uh, that is mentioned right here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 3. They sang, as it were, a new song. You see, uh, that new song is when the Lamb takes the scroll. And the 144,000 are the only ones who can learn it. Okay, and uh, uh, as you see, it's the same scene just shown from a different perspective. Okay, but th look at this. This is going to be the kicker because this is showing us when this is going to happen. Verse 4, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Okay, so here's the kicker. This should be the bow that wraps everything up. God says that the 144,000 are first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Okay, now the question is, what are first fruits? What, what's the pattern in the Bible about first fruits? So we know that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Okay, now look at this. This, this, is, this is going to be the kicker. This is going to be what tells the whole story. Okay, so first fruits. In my e-sword, I typed it in. 30 times, there's 30 verses that are found in all the scriptures about first fruits. And do you know the only two feasts where first fruits are mentioned are the feast of first fruits, which was the barley harvest, and then 50 days later on the feast of Shavuot, which we know as Pentecost, there's also first fruits offered. Okay, so look at this. This is this is Bible study. Okay. So first fruits. Leviticus chapter 23. There's three times that first fruits are mentioned. Chapter 10, I mean verse 10, verse 17 and verse 20. Okay, so let's go to Leviticus 23 because Leviticus 23 is all about the feast of the Lord. The first time first fruits are mentioned is in verse 10. And this is the feast of first fruits. Verse 9, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, you shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Okay, in verse, uh, in, 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 in the feast of first fruits, this was the barley harvest. Okay, this was the barley harvest. This is what Jesus Christ fulfilled when he first came. And he rose from the dead. Remember, Jesus Christ, he was our he he was our Passover lamb. He died on Passover, and then, in the feast of unleavened bread, he was buried in a borrowed tomb, and for three days and three nights he he was in uh, the heart of the earth. But at the time of the feast of first fruits, on that third day, early that Sunday morning, he rose from the dead, and he was the first fruits. Okay, Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. We see that here in the, in the New Testament, okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, so Jesus Christ, he fulfilled the feast of first fruits as being the barley uh, harvest, okay? He rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits. Get that, okay? So, back to Revelation chapter 14. God says that the 144,000 are first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So, with Jesus Christ already fulfilling the barley harvest of the first fruits, there's only one more feast where first fruits are offered to God. And so, because everything is a pattern, there can only be one feast that fulfills this scripture in Revelation chapter 14 with the 144,000 being first fruits to God. What feast is that? 
Okay, this is what the Bible says. This is what this is what I say. Everything is running to a pattern. It's it's, it's going off a pattern that God has established. Okay, and so here we go. The next time first fruits are mentioned, remember there's three times it's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, in chapter 23. We already read verse 10, which is the feast of first fruits. The next time it's mentioned, the next time it's mentioned is in verse 17, Leviticus chapter 23. This is the Feast of Weeks. This is Pentecost, Shavuot, verse 15. And you shall come, and you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, even seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. It's a new meat offering. Okay, and what's this new meat offering? Verse 17, you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Okay, the first fruits unto the Lord. The two wave loaves, the two wave loaves that were baked with leaven made a fine flour. They were to be first fruits unto the Lord. It's the only other scripture in regards to the seven feasts of the Lord, not counting the feast of first fruits. The only other feast where first fruits are offered is at Pentecost. The only other feast, the only other feast where first fruits are offered is at Pentecost. And what are the first fruits that are offered? It's two loaves, two loaves, two loaves that are baked with leaven, that are baked with leaven made of wheat. It's the wheat harvest. They are first fruits unto the Lord. That's it. That's all. God says that the 144,000 are first fruits. They have to fulfill the Pentecost model, because the 144,000 are first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Jesus Christ was the first fruits of the barley. That's already fulfilled. But the first fruits of the wheat harvest, which is, happens on Pentecost, has not been fulfilled yet. God says it's a new meat offering. Leviticus 23, verse 16, offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And what's the new meat offering? It's two wave loaves. It's two loaves baked with fine flour, baked with leaven. They are first fruits unto the Lord. The 144,000 are said to be first fruits to God and to the Lamb. They go into the Father's house first. The table of showbread, then the menorah. Jew and Gentile go into the Father's house together. The 144,000 are first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, fulfilling the Pentecost rapture. I don't know what else to say. I don't know what, what Pentecost. I don't know. I don't, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. But this has to be fulfilled. All I know is that this has to be fulfilled according to the model. According to the model, it has to be fulfilled. It has to be fulfilled. I'm not going to argue with anybody about it. I'm not going to argue about this with anybody. I'm just going to give out what the Bible says. I'm not arguing anymore. I'm not going to argue anymore with anybody. I'm just going to say what God says. This is what he says. Okay? This is what he says. This is what he says. Not what I, this is what he says. Okay? That's it. That's all. This is what he says. There has to be a fulfillment of first fruits during the time of Pentecost. It has to be. Now, if you want to argue that, you take it up with God. Okay, I'm not going to argue this. And God says that the 144,000 are first fruits. I mean, what else does he have to tell us? <laughs> he says the 144,000 are first fruits. Over and over and over again in this, in this Bible uh, teaching, we saw that the 144,000 are sealed first. They go into the Father's house first, Revelation chapter 7. Then the great multitude appears, the body of Christ. Revelation chapter 14, when the Lamb stands up, the 144,000 are with him. And then right after, a voice from heaven, like the voice of many water, like the voice of loud thunder is, is speaking. And they're saying, hallelujah, the marriage of the Lamb has come. 
That's the body of Christ. We're in there together. It's all a package deal. But the 144,000 are the first fruits. Hallelujah. Because they go in first. They go in first. They go in first. They go in first. Okay. Just as the temple is set up on the earth is going to be set up in heaven. And I'm going to get into another teaching because I just skimmed the surface, really, because there's more to this. <laughs> there's more to this. So if you want to study further, I suggest that you turn to first uh, uh, first, uh, first Chronicles. Oh my goodness. I, I had to really stop yesterday when I was studying this. It's just too much. It was, it was too much. <laughs> it was so much. This, this right here, this is, you talk about some meat. My goodness. This right here is telling us something real, real, real deep. This is a model. This is a model of what's going to take place. This is a model of what's going to take place when the rapture happens. This is a model, my friends. This is a model. And I'm still having the Holy Spirit teach me about what's going on here. But I, I, I would pray that you would get on your game as well and study First Chronicles 23 and understand that God is showing us a pattern. And this is in regards to the 144,000 and the 24 elders and the division of the priesthood. Okay. And it's just so much. It's just so much. It's just so much. But remember, this is a pattern. Okay. This is a pattern that God has given us. And we know that the priesthood has changed. Okay. It's now under the order of Melchizedek. Okay. And because there's been a change in the priesthood, now all of those who have called to be saints are now a royal priesthood. It's not just the tribe of Levi. Hallelujah. There's a change in the priesthood. Okay. And that change was before the tribe of Levi ever existed because the change in the priesthood is the order of Melchizedek to which the patriarch Abraham gave a 10th and uh, he was blessed by Melchizedek because the lesser is always blessed by the greater. Hallelujah. And uh, Melchizedek who had uh, no beginning, uh, had no genealogy, came out to meet Abraham after the battle with bread and wine. Hallelujah. <laughs> the king of righteousness. Oh, yeah. He's the pre-incarnate Christ. Hallelujah. And Jesus Christ, who is after the order of Melchizedek, has a royal priesthood from every tribe, language, nations, and tongues, because he has made us a kingdom of priests which is what God always intended since the beginning of creation for us to be sanctified, set apart, holy, and serving him as priests forever. Hallelujah. We are a tribe, a nation, a people. We are sons of God made to be priests forever. So this model, while it singles out the Levites, because this is under the Old Testament law, is giving us a pattern of the royal priesthood and how it's going to operate in the kingdom. Okay. And so I got, so it's a lot in here, so I can't get into the teaching right now, but understand that this is a model. This is a model of what's going to take place. Okay. This is a model of what's going to take place. You got to study this for yourself. It's, 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 it's really a, <laughs> it's a doozy. Hallelujah. And so, uh, Lord willing, I'll get to that soon once I iron out everything by the power of the Holy Spirit. But I pray that you got what I said today through the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you understand that the 144,000 are caught up. They're not going to be on the earth during the tribulation. I don't know where that teaching came from. The Bible, I don't understand why people don't just take what the Bible says. The Bible tells us who are going to be on the earth witnessing. I mean, it's right there in plain black and white English. No matter which translation you look at, if you got a reliable translation, Revelation chapter 11 tells us that there's going to be two witnesses. I just don't get why and how people have come up with this notion that the 144,000 are going to be sidekicks to the two witnesses. Where does it say that at? Where does it say that at? Show me in the scriptures where there's 144,000 sidekicks to the two witnesses. No. The Bible tells us exactly who are going to be on the earth. And these two witnesses are given supernatural power because if they didn't have it, they'd be killed as well. 
right when the tribulation begins. Okay, it's great tribulation for those who know Jesus right when it begins. But the two witnesses, they're supernaturally empowered and no one can harm them. If you try to harm them, they breathe fire out of their mouth, okay? And they have all types of power to smite the earth with all types of plagues, okay? They have power to shut heaven that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They have power over waters to turn them to blood as often as they desire, okay? These two witnesses are going to be the only people who are able to do anything for the name of Jesus during the first half of the tribulation. Oh, it's a terrible day. You see, and if they were not given supernatural power, if they were not given supernatural power, they would be killed right when the great tribulation begins. You see? There's not 144,000 sidekicks to the two witnesses. Get real. Where do you see that at? Where do you get that from? There are not 144,000 sidekicks to the two witnesses. The two witnesses are the only people who are able to stand during the first half of the tribulation. But as we know, if you read your Bible, it only happens for the first three and a half years because once the abomination of desolation happens, then the mask comes off and the devil kills the two witnesses because God gives him the power to do it for a purpose. Because three and a half days later, God raises the two witnesses from the dead and great fear falls upon everyone who sees it. Okay. You see, God has a purpose in everything. But if God did not supernaturally protect the two witnesses during the first half of the great tribulation for those who are left behind who know Jesus, do you think that they would be able to do anything? Of course not. I mean, people don't really understand how terrible the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble is. It's, it's a terrible day. I mean, I've said it over and over and over again, reading the Bible, putting emphasis on things. Because God says the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. God says he who is courageous amongst the mighty will flee away naked in that day. It shall be as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or went inside a house and leaned his hand on a wall and a serpent bit him. It's the fear, the pit, and the snare upon everyone who was left behind. It's the cloudy day, my friends. It's when all joy is darkened. Okay? It's when no flesh has peace. It's when people go and try to find strong drink and drink it, and it's still bitter unto them who drink it. All songs shall be turned into wailing. Every beard will be clipped and every head made bold. God says this, and I'm done. Look at this. Look at what God says in Isaiah. Look at what God says about those who are left behind. You talk about the cloudy day. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. This, this, this is what God says. Hallelujah. This is what God says about that day. Isaiah chapter 3. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Ain't no more smelling good during the time of Jacob's trouble. No more perfume. No one smells good. Everyone stinks. Everyone is unclean. Instead of a girdle, a rent. No more high fashion. No more getting dressed to the knives. No, no more stunting and no more keeping up with the Joneses. Oh, no. And instead of well-said hair, baldness. Okay, everyone's bald-headed. That's why they mocked the prophet Elisha when he was a bald man as a picture of the tribulation. Those 42 youths said, go up, you bald head. Go up, oh, bald head. <laughs> they mocked him. 
They mocked him. That's what's going to happen for everyone who's left behind. How come you weren't caught up? How come you weren't caught up in the rapture? You say that you know Jesus. Oh, well, they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you in that day. Oh, yeah. It's the fifth seal. And instead of a stomach, uh, a girding of sackcloth, sackcloth upon all loins, okay? No more wearing your three-piece suits. No more wearing your little black cocktail dresses. Oh, no. You got sackcloth on in that day. And burning instead of beauty, okay? Some translations say branding. Branding instead of beauty. That branding is six, six, six. Oh, yeah. It's a terrible day, my friends. You see? It's the great tribulation for those who are left behind who say that they know Jesus. Okay? The church of Thyatira gave us the warning. He throws that church that does not repent into great tribulation. It begins right away if you're left behind. No ands, ifs, or buts about it. The cloudy day, my friends. Well, I'm done. You know, I kind of went over time, but hey, God is good. I pray that it bless someone. Hey, we're all on uh, quote unquote lockdown anyway. So what else we got to do except to talk about Jesus, which we should have been doing all along. Hallelujah. So I pray that you took the time out as God led you to listen. And I pray that you finally, and I know that some people already know this, that you understand that the 144,000 are raptured. They're raptured, okay? They're the first fruits. It's right there in Revelation chapter uh, 14. They're the first fruits. They're the first fruits unto God, okay? I mean, you, 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 now, now you either have to pull something out of your rear end to say that there's something other than the first fruits when it says right here that, 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 that they're the first fruits, or you believe that what God says and you believe the pattern. So if Jesus Christ was the first fruits of the barley harvest, the only other harvest of the seven festivals, the only other of the seven feasts of the Lord that has anything to do with first fruits is the, is the feast of Pentecost, where a new meat offering is offered, where a new offering of meat is offered unto the Lord. It's something new, okay? It's a new meat offering unto the Lord. And that also has a first fruit offering. And it's two loaves, Jew and Gentile, okay? Jew and Gentile, okay? Jew and Gentile. And we who were born in sin have now been freed from sin, even though that's why this was the only offering that was made with leaven, okay? Okay, God has taken away all of our sin, but we were still born in sin, but we were born again, hallelujah. We were born again, hallelujah, and we will forever represent the mercy of God, the grace of God, how God has saved sinners, hallelujah. Even though we were born in sin, God took away all of our sin, and now God sees Christ in us, hallelujah. The one who knew no sin, he became sin for us. He is our advocate, hallelujah. You see, but it's all a type and a shadow of the good things to come. Because Christ is the substance. But this type and shadow has to be fulfilled. There has to be a first fruits offering unto the Lord. No matter which way you cut the cake. That first fruit offering. The next one that has to be fulfilled. The last one that is left is the Feast of Pentecost. It's the wheat harvest, my friends. I don't know when. I don't know what day, what hour. But surely King Jesus comes quickly. I love you. Maranatha. Amen.